but I think as humans and as society, I would say that the next five to 10 years are going to be decisive towards what are you going to be as humans for the next, next 1000? Because the, and I think I always look at two metaphors, the Star Trek uh, and the Star Wars or a bit uh, more like, uh, yeah, Star Trek and Star Wars or even uh, uh, Terminator. And the, the, the narrative of Star Trek is that we can go 1000 years in the future and humans still exist. There will be some shifts, there will be ups and downs, but okay, it's still okay. But if you go to the Star Wars, normally there's a, an emperor that take over the world of humanity or even Blade Runner, which Blade Runner is actually close to what is happening in humanity, is that five, ten corporations control the entire economy. Dennis Guarda is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Dennis is an author, academic, influencer, serial entrepreneur, and leader in the fourth industrial revolution, AI, fine tech, digital transformation, and blockchain. With over two decades of experience in international business, C-level positions, and digital transformation, Dennis has worked with new tech, cryptocurrencies, ICOs, and driven ICOs, regulation, compliance, legal, international process, and has created a bank and has been involved in the inception of some top 100 digital currencies. Dennis has created various companies such as Studium, and I'm not even sure if I say that right. It's with us. It's not Studium, but it's Zudium. A uh, tech platform, a digital and blockchain startup that created the software Block Impact, sold to Glance Technologies Incorporated, and founder and publisher of IntelligentHeadquarters.com, IntelligentHQ.com, HedgeThink.com, FashionABC.org, and tr TradersDNA.com. Dennis is also the co-founder of Tech ABC and Cities ABC, a digital transformation platform to empower, guide, and index cities through the fourth industrial revolution-based technologies like blockchain, AI, Internet of Things, and many, many more. He has been working with the likes of the United Nations, UNITAR, UNESCO, European Space Agency, Davos at the World Economic Forum, Philips, Saxe Bank, MasterCard, Barclays, and governments all around the world. As an author, Dennis Garter published the book, The Fourth Industrial Revolution, AI, Blockchain, Fintech, IoT, Reinventing a Nation in 2019, among other many, many things that he does. Um, his upcoming book is really, really interesting, Society 5.0, Magna Carta. And I'm hoping that today in our discussion, we can tick, tickle on these subjects uh, to charter the, the liberties for our humanity. And uh, I, ho I hope to uh, participate in that work with him as well on this new book. And I welcome you, Dennis, to the show. Thank you so much for being here. My honor. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited as well. It's, it's good to see you again. And I, I've done your um, events for Open Business Council and Sudium, and, and um, which, which have received a wonderful response, I think, over the three videos we've done and disseminated, you know, well over 30, 40,000 views. And, and uh, it was just a sheer pleasure. And it was right kind of shortly after the pandemic hit where we're all kind of in this crazy lockdown. I, I think you caught me with looking like Rip Van Winkle. I had a full, full grown beard and my hair down, but you were still kind enough to say, okay, well, uh, well I, I understand Mark. That's the crazy Mark. Um, I, I want to get right in uh, to the depth of things because you've been doing this for a long time. You've been involved in fine tech and banking and blockchain and technologies, emerging technologies for a long time. And then 
some of the things you were talking about, some of the transitions you were talking about really came to a fruition. And we were hit with the pandemic and crazy inauguration in the United States uh, or uh, vote and political issues. Then we were hit with Black Lives Matters and then Asian racism. And we're still kind of emerging from some pretty crazy times, not just around COVID and pandemic, but in our economies and in the markets and how blockchain ha has uh, emerged in this time. And so my real question is, one, how have you weathered this crazy time and this storm? I know the answer. I want to hear it from you. And has any of your previous models, you were well prepared and you weathered this crazy storm and this time very well and realized that there are some better business models out there or some better models for life to get through crazy hard times like the world has experienced? Yeah, very good question. I, I think the point right now is that, uh, of course, no one is completely prepared, but we have always to be prepared. So it's a kind of paradox, but it's what makes us humans. And I think especially people like us that are in business and thought leadership, I think one of the things I always like to, to go is go to the Bible uh, or go to the old writings. I'm a writer as well. And the point is, is that, like the Bible said, there's nothing new under the sun. So I think the first point is that uh, a lot of these things are things that unfortunately repeat itself around history. We are actually probably the best time in history being realistic. And I think it's very important to highlight that. And I know that you are an optimist. I think I would say that uh, it's very disruptive because if you go to history and you look at history, and I love history, is that uh, things normally happen slower than what we have in our times. In our times, things go much faster. And I think that creates a lot of disruption because our brains are not prepared for all this velocity. And of course, what happened in the last few years, especially in the context of the last 100 years, is probably the most disruptive with the exception of the Second World Wars because we have a massive pandemic that affects literally everyone in the planet. And, uh, but the thing is that purely from a data perspective, we actually, as a, as a human race, we actually, and I think no one speaks about this. And I want to, I want to highlight, normally I'm a bit prophet of the doom, but today I want to be a bit more positive as well, is that we actually react very well to this. Of course, there was, the United States management was not as good as now. As, I think it's a bit more wise, let's put it that way, and without going to politics. And of course, probably if we would have a bit more wise person there, probably a lot of things wouldn't happen the way they happen. But without going through that, I think in general, the humanity behaved very well. And, and to be honest, looking at the, the scope and scale of the pandemic, I think was we could be much worse, let's put it that way. Uh, I think it, it's, we always tend to see the, the impact and the negativity, but it was really, we are, the economy is still running, even if of course it's affecting millions and millions but there was for law in a lot of countries. I think I, I, I feel for a lot of, and for instance, even India initially dealt very well, which is probably, it was actually when the pandemic started for us, I was very worried for India. And unfortunately, uh, and actually ended up actually, but it was one year after, which is interesting that initially we were actually the wealthiest countries that were suffering more with the pandemic. So I would say that uh, I think the, the, and then coming to your direct question, the models that we are using right now are changing and they're going to be shifting faster and faster. And that definitely is going to be very com competitive and very, I would say not competitive, but very disruptive for people and for organizations. Uh, I don't believe so much in competition. I believe more in collaboration. But I think the challenge is, in one end is a perception challenge. In one end is the capacity of adaptability. And I think uh, that is where I think as society, we're not prepared. We're not prepared to be entrepreneurs. We're not prepared to deal with disruption. And we're not prepared for technology. And for instance, in my case, the, the pandemic, of course, initially was disturbing, but it became uh, quite, in, I've been managing it quite well because I've been already, my team is all over the world. We manage people all over the planet. We've been already working virtually for a lot of, a lot of years, let's put it that way. So it's nothing new what is happening, but of course it disrupts because there's a lot of deals you have to do face to face. Um, and, uh, and as well, even to meet people and to manage people is difficult. We forget that, but uh, just the one thing is that us talking like we're doing is fantastic because you can share ideas. And I think this, these platforms are amazing and they can actually make things that, that actually 
I'm learning massive with this podcast, with mine, with yours, and I think we'll listen to your podcast as well. But I think what I'm more excited right now is definitely the challenge are massive, but I believe that we can actually cope with this. And I think, I think that it comes my activist at is how we work as society. And of course, we work a lot in these topics. How we work to make this happen in a way that empowers and these tools that are disrupting us, that are built by us, first of all, they are tools for us, not just for us to be kind of used by these tools. And I think that's the biggest challenge. And I think on that level, I'm still very worried. I'm still worried about the power of AI not used wisely, about uh, a lot of other things related. But at the same time, I believe that uh, you, me, and our voices together can make a massive effort. And that's what I'm here. I'm having fun. I'm having trying to inspire and being inspired, but at the same time, not giving up. And I think that's the, there's a quote that is a bit too radical, but it's only the paranoid survive. I would prefer all the inspired entrepreneurs survive <laughs> or more and more adapt. Let's put it that way if you re redesign the quote. But I think in the sense that you cannot just sit and, and, and just, of course, in the, in the middle age, people would go and become monks <laughs> and, and they can do still meditation. But now even Wall Street is doing meditation. So I think it's, it's about the way we deal with these things and keep being humans. And I think that's what makes it special. Definitely it makes it so special. You're, you're a man who wears many hats. And so not only you're an author and a speaker and you, you teach uh, as well. So that's kind of one hat as a, not just an evangelist, but as someone who's sp spreading knowledge and awareness in your writings. Um, but then you also wear the, the hat as someone who is actually in there dealing with the technologies and the currencies and the banking and the fine tech and the, the the, the solutions by creating companies and create, creating products and apps and, and like, like I mentioned in the currencies. And then there's a third hat, right? Did I get the first two hats right? And, and, and the third yeah. hat is, is I, it I more around it, hum, humane technology and society? Yeah. And, okay. Yeah, my, my, for that is mostly really about, uh, first of all, is a, a, a bit of an activist, but in a good way, and working with governments or at least with institutions worldwide. And I think a bit like what you do as well, trying to push ideas that can actually make our society less dysfunctional. And uh, I do whatever I can to help. I, I do a lot of education now. Now I don't have time to teach as much as I used to do. But what I do is I try to do a lot of uh, lives help organizations, um, teach for free a lot of things and, and make sure that people that need because I, I believe really that with with the tools that we have anyone can actually live very well in the planet but most of people don't know how to do it and even me I'm learning every day so that's the further head so working with organizations helping um, when I can invest even small I'm not an investor but I try to help and fund things through my savings or through my team and things like that that's that's absolutely amazing, and the products that you guys are are turning out are uh, really invaluable, I think. And and I I want to I want to touch on those, and we'll get more into them in a minute. But you, I've heard you speak numerous times, and most of the time you're talking about the the coming tsunamis, and um, some, sometimes it's kind of dystopian. But actually, this time that we've just experienced was another, I would say, positive tsunami. And I wanted to get your takes because you've talked about that so much. How do you see it? And, and, and what do you feel about that? Yeah, I think uh, the next tsunami was a book. Actually, I never published completely, although I published a couple of articles on that that I do that is about uh, how the emerging technologies that are as well called the uh, uh, fourth industrial revolution technologies of frontier technologies are um, creating kind of continuous tsunamis. Um, and I think you can look at this from different angles, from the different angle. So the first angle is the way they affect society and you, us as humans. The second angle is how they affect society and our society societal behavior. Um, and the third one, of course, is that how are they affecting our world? Because of course, this is creating a huge change and shift nature faster than anything in history. So I think these three kind of tsunamis, and of course, if you look at nature, nature, uh, I think everything comes back to nature. Nature 
as a lot of hardcore events and we forget that is nature is I think there's this kind of excess that sometimes okay nature is very beautiful but nature is very hardcore a volcano is not necessarily something that is nice it can destroy an entire ecosystem and it doesn't care if there's if there's a bird or whatever the stuff it will destroy and it will do whatever it has to do because it's part of nature and then tsunami is the same a tsunami can destroy an entire ecosystem but it, it happens because earth is briefing and a lot of i'm trying to put this in a more simplistic way but it happens for a reason so i think uh, we as humans and i think there's a book that is very the name says everything from uh, uh from uh, arari uh no arari that is kind of a um, homo deus so i the, of course there's a title that is a, uh, a provocation but i think the idea of the tsunami when you look close to where we are as humans we have the powers of what in the beginning of times were the gods uh, in a lot of ways uh, of course i'm not saying this with any kind of disrespect for the religions but in the sense that we have powers that can actually transform everything around us and they can actually transform our own nature so uh, for instance, an example is that i did a, i did a, a live uh, a, uh, um, an, a keynote that was um hacking the dna of humanity and when i did that i thought it was i initially was kind of more conceptual but then i start initially i came up with the concept i started researching and then I, I started researching technology about it. So we effectively are hacking the DNA of humanity. And actually, I didn't know that when I started that. I thought it was more metaphoric because I thought it would take some years. No, it's happening. And it's happening a couple of years ago. So we have universities like Washington, I think it's Washington, a couple of universities that are hacking, literally hacking the DNA of humanity. And for instance, I, I saw uh, another podcast, fantastic, uh, last week with Lex Friedman and, and, um, and one fantastic uh, uh, Sinclair, the the guy from Harvard, is actually already. He has. He was saying, I have a lot of friends of mine that are just cloning their dogs. So um, this is not already in some kind of science fiction film. It's happening around us, and I think right now the challenge we have coming back to this is these tsunamis. If they are contained, are fantastic. But in the middle of this kind of disruption that we're doing, if we don't, if we're not careful. We can create like a massive tsunami that can actually create much more damage for humanity and that is kind of one of my challenges when it comes to especially artificial intelligence or even centralized technologies because the point is is and it's more even than data because data of course right now even as speaking my device knows what i'm saying it knows that i'm not moving it knows that i'm interacting with someone it knows my eyes and it probably knows more about my blood circulation than i know about mine and, and these things right now are happening as we speak. I think the point to summarize is that the tsunamis are important because we need all this to breathe. And actually, you know that, breathe. It's key for us as humans, and the meditation is about that. And meditation is not more probably than previously. If you would go to the church like 50 years ago or 100 people were just repeating something, which in the end of the day is meditating. And, and, and the way you would breathe and read the a, a prayer or something like that is not different from what we have now. We simply do it in a slightly different way that is much more scientific driven. Um, so I think I think this kind of the tsunamis, I'm quite worried because I think we are still. So the, the main worrying is the lack of understanding of the impacts of technologies. And that's for me the most radical um, thing for me is that people are not conscious about this. Whereas I have children, two teenagers and a daughter, and uh, they spend like 10 hours per day or more in front of the devices. And I think all of us spend around five, six or seven, depends. And now we, we are working from home even more. But the challenge is this, we, we all use the devices. For instance, yesterday I was talking with someone that works in one of the most advanced analytic tools in the world. And it was kind of paradoxic saying, I don't like to, to look at, uh, I, I don't like to give away my data, but your job is managing data and in a very high profile way. So you see the paradox of what you just said. You are one of the most advanced people in the world looking at data and you say that you are afraid of the data. So then you don't have a job. So I think it's how you look at this and, and look at this from an angle. OK, there's a radical level that can actually create the tsunami and there's a level that tsunami can actually help us to readjust this. And I think that is the, the balance that I try to do in my work. And that's the concept as well of Society 5.0 is a society that the, the tools empower us and is a humanity-centric humanity society. Because the fourth industrial revolution is still from the perspective of revolution, the perspective of the tools, 
but I think it has to be from the perspective of human humanity. And our humanity needs to be first, and of course in balance with the nature, because it's the only way for us to, to well, first of all, have an environmental, sustainable, and as well, wellness ecosystem and, and human direction. So I'm, I have to totally agree with you, but you've opened up uh, a box here that I want to go a, a little bit deeper into, uh, if you don't mind. So you've all know Harari, fabulous author, fabulous uh, speaker, and uh, one of the wise men of our decade, century. And he, um, Homo Duos, I have to agree with you, wonderful book, Homo Sapiens, and 21 questions or 21 lessons is fabulous as well. Just a wonderful wisdoms that come out there, um, which are eye-opening. But right now we're really experiencing a lot of things. So the, the uh, Edward Snowden documentary came out, many things came out there, things coming to light as far as the technology involved and, and what governments are using for humanity and using tools and things very advanced, be able to monitor uh, a lot of things around the world. Um, we had a big, huge problem with the election. That's why I say, you know, how we weathered the crazy time of this, the inauguration and the pre-election and that, and there was, uh, you know, issues about whether the vote was correct and, and all sorts of things. Um, you know, I was trained by Al Gore uh, um, as a climate leader and speaker. Well, in 2000, when Al Gore was uh, voting and that, there was the big dimple chat issue regarding elections in Florida, where there was these little bubbles on the, the voting thing that they can, is that a vote? Is that not a vote? Is it a dimple? Is it not? And since then, what I would say we're still not 100% everywhere in the world in this digital transformation or revolution or in the transition, we're still trying to get there. But we're, now we're 20, um, 2021 dealing with election issues and craziness still, which is unheard of. It's, un it's really unbelievable. And blockchain, emerging technologies, distributed ledger technology, machine learning, all these things could easily fix it. I was like really thinking the minute Biden got into office, I'm glad he doubled down on the Paris Agreement. I'm glad he went back into climate and, and uh, changing for uh, the plan of energy for the United States. But why in the hell wouldn't you fix the election process into one that is a trustless system, one that works for everyone so that we don't have this problem again? And but that, I'm not done yet. It leads me to one more thing. The, the documentary, The Social Dilemma came out and, and the discussion around humane technology and tech for good. And I really want to know, um, because you are an activist and because you're so entrenched in all these things, how do we get those leaders around the world, and I, I had one of them on my podcast, uh, uh, Minister Audrey Tang, who is probably one of the most advanced around broadband as a human right and humane technology and how we do upvotes and how, how do we filter out fake news. How do we make that transition so that it's a world that works for everyone and one that's trustless? And what are your thoughts and feelings about all these things that, are, that, that we're seeing in the world, but where the applications are coming, they are being applied or they're not 100% there. I kind of want to get your thoughts and feelings on those things so that we don't run into the problems in the future or, or what your forecast is in some extent. Well, it's, it's a big question. So I would look at the question in two ways. So one is, how we should approach that as society. And in the other ways is how we, well, well, the urgency to look at this. So, uh, and as well, the challenges that are part of that, that urgency. So as society, the challenge we are facing right now is, is definitely that um, there's a lot of legacy systems and the lack of issues in terms of education. Our education systems are not uh, coping with the velocity. So we have, um, we have and this part is, is normal nature, we took, like you mentioned, the Homo sapiens from Harari. 
and it took 30,000 years for us to become what we have now. And the point is right now in the space of 10 years, we are changing who we are, both physically, because right now we are becoming androids because probably most of our time we have a device with us or we are using technology. So we already kind of, kind of not androids, but cyborgs at least. So that is happening, okay? Whatever we like it or not, everyone, even probably someone in the 70s or something like that, you're using technology in one way or the other. And this technology is a kind of a, a new layer of our humanity. The point is that there's a kind of a, sometimes a very basic way of looking at this. There's a, a, a way of looking at this that is, okay, yeah, okay, all technology is bad. Uh, and, then, uh, and then people don't do their homework. When you start this kind of very big assumptions is the risk. Because it, it, that's what happened with the elections in the US that you mentioned is, and actually both of them is that when you do assumptions, people don't think out of the box. And if you don't think out of the box, you create, okay, people will try to get someone to think for them, is the, the old expression. And when you start having people to think for yourself, you will follow someone, you will get a video on YouTube, or you just get your religion and you follow the person. And then this becomes in a rabbit hole that is kind of unique. And that is humanity on its kind of millions of years of history. But I think the challenge right now is that as we are accelerating all of these different things, and as society is partly coping or not coping, because even if, we, if society doesn't cope, it will be indirectly, is the tsunami coming again? Because, okay, you don't cope with it, he'll cope with you. So it's what happened. And this is happening as you speak. It's happening, for instance, COVID-19 was the biggest accelerator of digital transformation and it accelerated probably 10 years because the world economy right now is sustainable by digital tools. Um, and that's a lot of companies right now, they want to get, they want they, their employees to go back and they don't want to go. Uh, and so this is a challenge and an opportunity. And as well, this proved a lot, for instance, an example, and I'm not going to politics, but for instance, there was a lot of things that some, for instance, the universal income and other things that people would never think a couple of years ago, now this is not realistic and doesn't make any sense. It makes complete sense, at least to make sure that we kill the poverty levels, but we need to keep people incentive because of course the machines are going to replace most of our basic things, but you still have, for instance, like a, for instance, the number of billionaires in the world and we are actually the most wealthy people, even me and you speaking here in the world, because we are part of the 1% or even probably 0.5%. But the challenge is that the rest of the population in the world, the, the billionaires are like 1.5, 1,500 people in the world, not more than 2,000 people. But these people have more power combined than all these three humanity. But the point is that this kind of power is in a different level right now. Is there is a power that is, is a power that is financial, is economical, but is as well in terms of healthcare and in terms of mind expansion. So I think all of this together is creating a huge uh, paradox. And I believe in humanity, but I believe that humanity on that level, I'm a bit Kubrick. Um, I love Kubrick because uh, if you look at 2000, uh, 2001, Odyssey is that uh, humanity is a bit like a swarm sometimes. It's kind of, we, we go in our instincts and our swarm part of our DNA sometimes is not necessarily very nice. We get jealous, even the people we love, we end up actually having fights, divorces, and even with our children because we have to, to push things. So, so I think that part of the humanity DNA that is what makes us special is as well a challenge. And as well as we put this with machines, the machines will be reflecting that. And especially the machines will be learning with data. And the data, uh, even if you are, for instance, if you are coding something in China, but it's today, actually, that is in the news that China launched the digital yen, and there's already 3,000 ATMs that can be used to get digital yen. So you don't need paper anymore to get this. But the United States is still paper. For it's all the, the trillion dollars of, of funding that was given to the, to the U.S. economy and population was done by paper. It was a check. <laughs> China is already 10 years or 20 ahead of the rest of the world. So we have this part of, and China is a slightly different democracy from the rest of the world. So you know what I mean? So I think that the challenge right now is, so I think to answer and to try to go to the point of the root of the point is, our challenge right now is making sure that these layers of technology, and of course all the climate change that you are the expert and other people is that all of this has to be managed in an intelligent way. Because of course, as humans and the planet of course is quite big because most of the planet is sea, and we can populate a lot of things. I'm not worried about the planet because the planet will clean in itself. It's part of nature. 
Uh, of course, the, the consequences and acceleration of a lot of things is different. But I think as humans and as society, I would say that the next five to 10 years are going to be decisive towards what are you going to be as humans for the next, next 1,000? Because the, and I think I always look at two metaphors, the Star Trek uh, and the Star Wars or a bit uh, more like, uh, yeah, Star Trek and Star Wars or even uh, uh, Terminator. And the, the, the narrative of Star Trek is that we can go 1,000 years in the future and humanity, humans still exist. There will be some shifts, there will be ups and downs, but okay, it's still okay. But if you go to the Star Wars, normally there's a, an emperor that take over the world of humanity or even Blade Runner, which Blade Runner is actually close to what is happening in humanity, is that five, 10 corporations control the entire economy. Um, and this, the point is I have nothing against this, these corporations. We all work with them directly and directly is that they did everything legal. So, but the point is that, uh, and I will give a small example to explain the, com the I think the, the importance is the layers, okay? And that small example was that I was approached to build a software for a central bank in Africa, in one of the economies, I'm not going to mention names. And it was a very exciting project. It took me a lot of time to accept because initially I was afraid with the, with the, because of the country. If you look at their Wikipedia page, you would get scared and I got scared. Uh, and then I started working and I was very excited. I, I did a couple of conferences and actually created a small FinTech revolution in the country and, and actually a lot of things just, just by talking, I help a lot of things. But then as we start building the software, we understood the nuances and the implications is that building the software, of course we, did, we were a startup building something for a central bank, which is different from a Google. But what I understood was if I would be Google, I would take over the country economy in two minutes because the point is that you build the software, you give it for free, then you have the date of the country. And that's as well what, uh, what Arari says in the 20 lessons for the 20th century. So this is happening as we speak. But right now is how we confront this, especially to avoid the happenings of the elections, because the US elections is a, a paradox that shows that even in the country that is the wealthiest economy or second wealthiest right now in the world, a huge part of the population doesn't believe on the truth and on the facts. And they don't want to believe on the facts and on the truth. That part for me is the part that scares me a lot. But, it, but just apply that to technology. So if you are coding, so this 50% of the population of US of 40 that don't believe in the reality and they want to write another reality, if they're coding software, I don't need to say more, no? So, and this is the biggest challenge that never happened in humanity because if you're coding software, thinking that you create your parallel reality and you don't want to look at the facts and scientific evidence, scientific numbers, what is going to happen is that, okay, these people are not stupid, they are intelligent people, but humanity, it's contradictive and it's full of paradoxes. Uh, so I think that is the part that scares me and it scares me and that's why I, I focus, I think the answer is education and coaching and continuous education, continuous coaching. But it's not so, just the education, it has to be education that prepares people for reality. Because that's one yeah. of the things that, I am just to finish. I really want to emphasize this: the coaching for reality is critical. Because I see my children. I have one stepson in the university, and during the pandemic, he had not one single class he was with teachers. And he doesn't feel it's important, and the teachers didn't oblige him. So, how the hell are one university allow a student to be one entire year without one lesson face to face? without meeting one teacher. That means, yes, he's a very smart guy, but the this, this university is giving, and this is my stepson, okay? So I get double nervous because he is a smart guy. He has me and mother and everything else to push him, but imagine another person. So that means you go to the university, you get a steal a course, but you don't care less about the institutions. You don't care less about the people. And this is actually happening as we speak. So this is the challenge that we have, but these people are still not the problem. The problem is the other people that are learning for you too. And they're learning for YouTube. You can find something if the algorithm picks something. You'll, you you got the picture. So sorry, I don't want to. Yeah. I think it's a no, long you, answer, but it's a it's a very big you're question fine. to ask. You you've done a lot of projects. Where, you know, help banks create uh, over a hundred different uh, currencies, and and uh, I know you worked for or tried to work. I don't know how it went with uh, Acon as well on a project and and um, uh, many other things. And so 
it, it, it's great to see that, that there's people out there who are really um, like the social dilemma, like uh, Tristram Harris, who's trying to, you know, put the humane part back into technology and let's use this for good um, and, and for the right reasons to fix some of these broken systems we have. That's kind of how we originally came together. You know, we um, were having our discussions and, and we were talking about sustainability and cities and, and how we can use these emerging technologies for good to, to create it and how the United Nations and the World Economic Forum has started to evolve and, and use them as well. Your company, uh, Studium, has uh, several products and I mentioned some of them. Blocks DNA, influence DNA, block impact, life's DNA, um, and cities ABC, and some of them we can see behind you on your on your background. But I want to go in, if you don't mind, a little bit more about your cities ABC and what that has the potential to do. And I know some things are evolving, some things are getting ready to launch and you've redesigned and update to be even more tools available. And I, I wouldn't even mind if while you tell us about it, you as long as you kind of give us the, the audible walkthrough for those who are only listening to this on a podcast, that they can understand what they're seeing, but also so that those of us who are watching can maybe get a tickle of an inside or behind the scenes look at Cities ABC and what you do with that and how you're using these emerging technologies to advance and help uh, help humanity. Yeah, so thank you so much for the opportunity. So, so I think with Cities ABC, so Cities ABC came out of um, the work I was doing actually with the government of Malaysia what I actually worked for a couple of years in the advising and actually I helped creating the concept of Malaysia 5.0, um, which was all done pro bono, which was probably not very good from my side. But one of the things I found out was that uh, there was a huge disconnection in terms of data from cities. And I got actually very nervous because I thought, okay, how is it possible that uh, the most important part of the world economy as very small to no data. And, and I thought, okay, let's then try to create something that can actually help people. So mostly the platform was created as a way of looking, okay, how can we look at, um, at cities uh, in a platform a bit like a Bloomberg terminal for cities that anyone can come and find data, but find data that is, most of the data ironically is based worldwide. It's public, okay? There's a huge amount of data that is public and you can find the data. The challenge is that this data it is connected, and I'll share the screen. And when it comes, and of course, there will be a new iteration of the platform being, being created as we speak, and they're going to be launched soon. But the idea is very straightforward. So I'm just going to get, so 60 cities in the world represent around 60% of the world economy. And for instance, if I go, let's say if I go to, at the moment, we still didn't put, but we are putting all the cities in the world here. At the moment, we are actually working for this. If I go to, let's go to an African, let's go here to an African city, Luanda, Kinshasa. So what we did was we created a bit like a Wikipedia for cities because the irony is even the Wikipedia pages, um, when you get out of the top like 100, 200 cities, it becomes really, there's a lot of contradiction data. So for now, and actually we, we pause for now to create the entries because we are doing like three layers of data. So. The Cities ABC is, in one end, a platform for creating like a Bloomberg terminal for cities, but open to everyone. And then we'll make money for a subscription that the cities can have for getting more access data and APIs. And uh, the point one is really just finding data, which is difficult, but we're building as well an algorithm called Index DNA, Cities ABC Index DNA, uh, that is about looking at data from the perspective of sustainable developing goals and finding this. So as the data gets more mature and we get more information, this algorithm starts looking how sustainable the city is, how wellness it is, and so forth. And then we build as well another part that is the most advanced part that we're building right now, that is a section that you can actually look at information. So this is something we work with a company called Revenpack that is a very advanced data that it works with machine learning and artificial intelligence. And for instance, if I go, this is for coronavirus data. And um, 
we are working in terms of uh, building these things in the right way. So if I go right now, look at data worldwide, and then I compare this with the United States, I can check the data about the United States. And then you see I have COVID-19 cases. And then we have this, so mostly we pick data that is available for everyone. We clean the data and we offer the data. So this gives us a more interesting, and this is available for everyone, it's for free. And we want to make sure that this data is democratized, but people sometimes don't use it. And, and if you look at this, you can actually um, find a way to organize the different things of the topics. For instance, the most important topic trending around COVID is vaccine. The second is fear and the third is panic. The fourth is lockdown. And this is based on data from the biggest media players in the planet. And then you have the media hype, you have the fake news index, you have country sentiment data, you have infodemic, you have all these different things. So if I look, for instance, in terms of the, the sentiment, country sentiment index, it allows me to look, for instance, I have the United States, let's compare, for instance, with India. And if I look at the, the country sentiment, as you see, for instance, the data in, in India is much more negative, it's minus 40%. And in May, during the peak, was minus 69. So that means people were in really panic. So this is a simple way to see data that you can only look at if you are the FBI or something like that. But anyone can have access to this. And we want with this for people to be conscious and look at the facts. Okay, this is kind of based in 20, around 22,000 sources of credible data worldwide. And of course, the data is clean and prepared on this level. And then one thing is interesting as well, because I know that you quite impressed on these things as well, is the fake news index. So you can actually look. So at the moment, the fake news index, thankful, is not as bad as it used to be in the last year. And I think we all know partly why, at least people in kind of a target audience of your podcast. But if you go to other things, unfortunately, it's not completely the same. So if I go to Brazil or France or Turkey or Russia, let's compare with Russia, I'll look at the fake news index. So as you see, Russia <laughs> has much more things related with fake news than than the rest of the world um, that's partly reasons for that i'm not going to the politic parts but this shows as well the complexity but this is really based on data that everyone um can actually um can look um so you got the picture so i think this is partly what you do and then i think the last part um uh, what you're trying to do is is building as well this platform to become a marketplace that can empower people. And of course, one of the biggest trends right now in the world is NFTs. And we, I'm, I'm, as you know, I've been working blockchain technology since the beginning of blockchain, actually before the concept was mainstream. So what we're doing right now is using NFTs, non-fungible tokens. That is mostly like a digital certificate um, and uh, working uh, to build this and offer this to people, but for creators, for instance, there's around 3 million creators in the world, 3 to 5 million creators, and most of these 3 to 5 million creators are living under poverty line. And people forget that, and this is people that study and so forth. So building this, and actually most of them are influential, ironically. And during COVID, they were very, um, they suffered quite a lot with this. So we're building a, an NFT marketplace on the top of the platform, that anyone can come and see. And then of course we have content, a lot of resources that actually can be, uh, um, anyone can have access about healthcare and sustainability, peer-to-peer uh, -to -peer people and opinions, education, tech data and smart cities, circular economy. Anyone can come, there's interviews, there's your interview, there's a lot of things. We're going to be interviewing personalities. Actually we're launching a new podcast. There is a, a podcast uh, with Hilton, Supra and George Saledi that is about uh, inclusion, diversity, and LGBTQ, because I think it's an important thing. So we're going to be looking at this, and as well, we want to be diverse on that level. So the idea is to create, and of course, promote, uh, actually, we need to promote your podcast as well here. So the idea is this is a platform open, and as we get a bit more of funding and more capacity, we're working a lot of crowdfunding solutions, we want to make this an app decentralized. So using DeFi, we can actually make the app available for anyone. And that means you are a city for the marketplace. You can actually do an NFT between a creator, a not-for-profit and so forth. We're working with the Billion Stronger, actually Mark, you should interview uh, the founder of Billion Strong. So Billion Stronger is an organization that is led uh, by um, uh, Deborah Rue and uh, is focused on looking at 1.3 billion people worldwide that are 
that live with disabilities. There's 1.3 billion people and people don't know about it. So, um, so they, and these people have not even the basic digital inclusion. For instance, actually it's interesting, in the last event we had a, a, a blind poet actually reading poems and I was amazed because uh, we actually had two blind people, but one of them is the, is the head of the blind association in the US and he was using, I could not believe because he used his phone to get into Zoom and get in the live without any help. And uh, this is as well how technology is amazing. So, so the idea is that we are working with them to make sure that the platform reflects that. But it's very similar to what you discussed in this podcast. But the idea of the platform is really democratizing data for cities and using this data for finding solutions. So it's this and everything we're doing for the Open Business Council is the same and Fashion ABC. Fashion ABC and textile, uh, the reason we created because the textile industry is the second biggest employer in the world. And most of them are women. And they live under poverty, <laughs> and uh, and sometimes we forget these things. And it's as well the biggest, the second biggest polluter in the world. And you know that's better than anyone else. So that's the reason why we create these platforms using the same technology. And as well, we're trying to take it to the next level. Thank you so much for sharing that. And it's it's beautiful to kind of get a behind the scenes and a, a little guide on on how it can be used. You're also um, kind of adding some new things. You've just made an update there, uh, not only the website and some other things, so we can expect much more um, there as a tool, which is important for, for cities. So when we talk about sustainable development goals, it's usually at the country level. Um, since we last spoke, the Sustainable Development Goals and the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Solutions Network, which is kind of the MOOC education network that's really responsible for reporting the SDGs, has done a uh, SDG daily real-time uh, update where they're taking each of the 17 goals and they're putting those real-time updates on actions and how, how it's going, how, how the uh, national commitments are going, where is it at? Um, just last, actually, sorry, just this week on Monday the 14th was the launch of the 2021 SDG report. Um, normally it's around September, but because of uh, the pandemic and many other things, they're releasing it early, six months into into the year and uh, we're um, on a country level further behind than we've ever been on the sustainable development goals because of the the shift towards the pandemic and and some other uh, other reasons that kind of backed off but if you overlay that with your city's abc and you overlay that with the un global compact and the data around sustainability uh, from businesses and organizations that have doubled down and made commitments, um, you actually see that it's more than tripled for businesses and cities doubling down and doing more actions towards the Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Agreement and ESGs, uh, Environmental Social Governance, than ever before. And so they're taking up that slack on, uh, on a country level. The problem is, is the report was specifically on countries reporting and their data, but uh, tools like what you have uh, on Cities ABC and those are the real-time index of the SDGs are tools that we need to kind of merge together to get this overview. Where are we? Where do we stand and how we're progressing? And I really love how, how, how you do that. And I, I, I thank you for, for showing us that. Now, I, I do want to touch a little bit on uh, the 4IR, which is your book, The Fourth Industrial Revolution. I'd like you to kind of give us the cliff notes on, on why it's important, why you originally came out with it, and then um, and, and tell us what you're seeing, whether it's coming to fruition or how it can help us by 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 reading that and give us a little more insight but then i also want you to tickle and tease a little bit about society 5.0 when you're done with that yeah so this is the book and as you see it's 4 ar um blockchain ai um iot and uh, uh fintech and there is reinventing a nation and um so i, I built this book actually with the Reza Hussain, and that is a person from the government of malaysia um so 
mostly what we we decided to do with this book was mostly a frame for how to so a lot of countries have no idea how to deal with digital digital transformation and my point was okay let's create like a book initially i was writing something much more advanced but then i understood the lack as i started dealing with countries and governments it's really alarming the lack of understanding about data and everyone has an opinion but really no one and even what is blockchain what is ai and all these different things of course right now i think covid accelerated that thankfully but there's still we still have a lot of work to do so the fourth industrial revolution looks at society in the perspective of the different uh, uh revolutions that we had and uh, what we're trying to do right now is how to look at these revolutions in a way that can actually empower us and the fourth industrial revolution is that one that looks at our society as a more advanced society that uses these societies and it's still a revolution in a lot of ways because it's a key um in terms of how the frontier technologies that is mostly the ones i mentioned so blockchain artificial intelligence iot and fintech and these ones are actually under this you have like others how these technologies are disrupting our society but as well creating a cognitive revolution that can actually be taken in a negative way in positive way but i always like to look at the positive side and i think my point here was okay there's two ways or we take this series and we start working this in the right direction which is the best way to go and if we do this in the right direction we can go 10 times faster as society and that's exactly what this book is about is a is a is a solution driven book that offers the frame for society that is quite easy to read there's a lot of uh, context a lot of uh, educations and it's it's straightforward i think for someone that doesn't understand about this is available on amazon um and um and i think anyone in the planet can read and i think especially can help people tackling some of these issues and i think that is kind of what i'm trying to do is making sure that people look at that in a way that helps um scale but helps as well people understanding that uh, again this is it's something that it's for everyone okay it's not just for people like you and me that are experts and they're working on these areas but someone that this can help everyone and can create a lot of solutions and that's what we try to do with this book it's a book that has a lot of contributions from experts worldwide academics and um and i'm actually glad because the book was used as the frame for malaysia 5.0 um and the concept of malaysia 5.0 is, is actually came from the society 5.0 and the society 5.0 i think is a more balanced concept than the fourth industrial revolution because the, the fourth industrial revolution still looks at society from a perspective of revolution that we have to break to get something new i know i don't believe too much in break i think we have more and i'll just share one infographic that i did that i think explains this better than anything even explained the, the parallel because there's a lot of myths around this and i did of course i've been working on this for a couple of years Please, i'll just share yeah. this graphic because i think will help uh, special people listen to us how to um how to mostly look at i think the infographic is quite easy to relate and i'm always trying to do it in a in a very practical way so i think uh, when we we make and actually you are in german where actually the, the industry 4.0 and actually ironically the concept of industry 5.0 came from a research done in the university of durham with a actually a partner of mine which is actually a small world and um what they it was a student that took this and passed it to the government of 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 german and then it became actually the industry 4.0 that became the industry the then the the world economic forum took it as well and then became what we have now as the the what we're talking about so i think uh, let me share the screen shortly so this infographic i think uh, explains what we're talking about so the so i think here we have a parallel between the the society 5.0 and the fourth industrial revolution so if you look at the the five stages of developing of humanity you have the first stage there was the first humans the dawn of humanity or at least the first evolution part where we have the hunting society the homo sapiens and the coexistence with nature then we went we we spent actually uh it took like thousands of years until we went to society 5.0 and this was in the 23 21000 23000 years before christ and there was an agrarian society which was kind of the society that created the first empires the first uh, tribes and everything else then we went immediately to the 18th century so it took us like thousands of years to go to the society 3.0 but the irony is that 
in the space of 100 years, we had a massive revolution. So the society 3.0 and the first industrial revolution. So in the space of uh, the society 3.0, we had four revolutions. So that, that means in the last 100 years, we had 100, four revolutions that were the biggest in history of humanity. And this is very important because when we look at history, and this comes back to the tsunamis, this is massive because of course, in the space of one year, we have more revolutions than all the history of humanity. But now, in the space, just in the space of 20 years, we have two revolutions. And then, of course, uh, the, I mentioned the fourth industrial revolution, that is my, my book, and it's about intelligence, digital transformation, big data, and all these different things. The third one was very related. There was the computer internet, ICTH, and the emergence of services society. So this was in the space of 20, 30 years. So the point right now is that the uh, society 5.0, and this is something that I'm working um, and that's why my book, my new book is called Society 5.0 uh, Magna Carta. It's about a, a super intelligent consciousness society, which is what you preach in your podcast and very well. And as well, your, you mentioned the SDG, the SDG. So it's looking at smart and sustainable circular economic society that looks at AGI. So AGI is artificially or uh, augmented general intelligence. So which is going to happening as we speak. So we are already reaching singularity and we are as well looking at data empowered of smart cities, digital twins, robotics and augmented open API. So that means this is going to help us as humans progress. But my focus, and that's why I call it Magna Carta. Actually, I was very glad to have signed a deal with the Magna Carta Island that still exists the, actually in the same stone where 800 years ago was signed the, uh, the Magna Carta. I signed actually a deal there. I'm very proud of that. But the, the Magna Carta was the first constitution between all the elements. So uh, the Society 5.0, I think it's a more kind of utopian, but as well more pragmatic way of looking at all the challenges of society. And that's therefore the Magna Carta, because I believe that Magna Carta was the first stage where all the different, it was the first time in history where all the different kind of at least officially the document, all the different parts of society from the kingdom and the aristocracy. And this was 800 years ago. <laughs> At the time, there was no sense of democracy where all of them sign a coexistent treaty. So I think that's a very important thing. And it created, of course, the law that we are still using after 800 years. So I think this is key for us. And, um, and I think I believe on these concepts. And that's why I'm actually writing my book about this. There's actually only two books in the world written about this. Um, and this is a concept that is quite new, was developed partly by a lady that is right now one of the directors of OECD worldwide, um, but uh, a new, uh, Japanese lady. But it's really an important concept because I think it's more humanity centric and it touches all the different things, but it's about society. It's not about technology, it's not about revolutions, it's not about, I think we had enough revolutions. We need right now to evolve as humans. So I've actually got four more questions for you before we, we wrap it up. And, and so I'm going to ask you to keep it succinct because we, uh, we've got to keep it down to a certain time. But it's really so we've talked about all these technologies, and I'm sure through throughout your time of going through all these, especially as an activist and being so concerned about hum, humane technology and society, have you run into things like um, the talk of the heavy energy use in technologies, especially blockchain and cryptocurrencies and mining. And what are your thoughts and feelings on that? And then as well as some of these technologies for good, for, for really for good, like a, a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization. Um, I belong for, uh, to, with the UN and other organizations to the Climate Change Coalition and the um, Digital Twin for the Earth project and the Digital Ecosystem for the Earth. And these are ones trying to use emerging pioneering technologies to really give us the heart blood, the pulse of our Earth and, and also trying to solve some of these big solutions that we talked about. And so I wanna know what you're seeing in the heavy energy use around technologies and is that improving? Is people, are people going more to green? And then also on the technology itself, what are you seeing as some real super solutions to get us over that hurdle into the decades that we need to be in? 
Well, that's a big question. So I'll try to answer that as synthetic as possible. So I, I think on the, the energy consumption around blockchain technology. So I don't think it's a big problem. I think it's being solved as we speak. There's already a lot of blockchain solutions that are completely green. Bitcoin is still uh, the biggest one that is challenged on Ethereum, but even Ethereum is already working on that. So it's just a question of a couple of years and will be fixed, probably one year or two, even less. Um, and ironic, even, even Elon Musk, uh, that has been kind of disrupting the market is working as well in some solutions. So I believe that that is not the big problem. It's not the biggest issues we're facing as humanity, but it's being solved. Um, so I think there's a lot of uh, already solutions on that. That's point one. I think uh, most of the, the providers of mining are already looking at solutions that are more sustainable. I would say a couple of months, one year. That's, that's the point. Of course, there's a lot of things that have to be considered, but uh, I think everyone is conscious about that and is very looking at a sense of urgency on that. So I'm not worried about it. Then on the, on the energy part, I'm, I'm quite optimistic. For instance, I'm working in a project uh, um, that is focused on carbon neutral solutions. And I think most of the big corporations, and I'm a huge, uh, actually I did a couple of videos about ESG, environmental governance and or sustainability and governance and, and uh, social, sociability and, and, uh, and governance. I believe that all the companies in the world are conscious about this. So I, I believe the challenge, of course, is that there's 430 million SMEs and micro SMEs. Most of them, of course, are not conscious of that, but the top ones are. And the, and the most of the government, especially right now with the new us uh, governance i think we're going to have a bit more of peace on this concept i think people know that we have to work together because we cannot have um a lot of the things happening so i think most and even i think this week was that uh, even the biggest uh, oil companies are moving to esg kind of solutions and sustainability so and i think partly i think Elon Musk did a massive revolution with electric cars that that i think at the moment we can have electric planes so so that means if we get everything electric, a lot of these issues will disappear. So I would say I'm actually quite optimistic on that. I'm not an expert in the energy, um, but I'm actually quite, um, I think what is important right now is the continuous education and tackling these solutions from a political policy making and like you're doing with groups and as well coming up with practicalities because I, I really, I'm a huge policy making um, fan, but in the end of the day it's about how can we get this to the people? So I think that's my try synthetic answer to you. Thank you so much. The, the biggest and hardest question I have for you today is really the burning question, WTF. And it's not the swear word, although maybe you've said that in this crazy time for the last 15 months. It's actually what's the futures or what's the future? And I mean, specifically for you, specifically for your companies, what is your plan? What's your roadmap? Where are you going and, and how, how do you see it? So I think for me, um, of course, I, as an entrepreneur, I have a dilemma between my side as an entrepreneur and my side as, as a, a thought leader. And sometimes this, and as well as a creative, because I write and I draw and I do a lot of creative things. So I try to make sure that the three parts of my personality all work together. And as well that we create, a, I think the biggest challenge is definitely um, I think the wellness and well-being, how to deal with all these things and, and keep a positive mind because it's not easy, especially people like us that we are working in different time zones with people all over the world, keeping our families, keeping our bells. I think that's the biggest challenge because we are, I think there's enough abundance in the world for everyone to live well and above poverty levels. And I'm actually fighting for that. Um, um, besides that, of course, is a is a is a bridge between our ambition, our balance as humans, and I think that's the biggest thing. And I, I think bearing that in mind, my focus as a company is, is to build more sustainable companies that are really related in ecosystems. And of course, I want to make money as an entrepreneur, but the money was not in my drive. Actually, I lost a lot of money because of that. So, like you like you mentioned, I created the bank and I got out of zero because I didn't do my contracts well. But because I, I was very focused in making things that things go well, um, so I, of course I want to make sure that we create wealth, we create uh, sustainable wealth, but at the same time that we create value. The value is the most important thing for me, and I believe that because of that, and I think when I go back to that base, I find wonderful people to work with. I find people like you, and we just need to cooperate and finding bridges. I believe, and you mentioned DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. For instance, I work with the 
Sophia the robot uh, and uh, and some of the team, for instance, um, Ben Gorsley, which is uh, uh, someone I deeply respect and I profile a couple of times and I, I, a good good relationship, is that uh, Sophia did a, did a, did a DAO. And actually, it's interesting that Sophia is the first uh, advanced robot that was created non-military. Um, and it's interesting that they decentralized the, the intelligence of Sophia and the artificial intelligence in an open AI, which is fantastic because that means no one can actually control and it created a much better way of, of actually safeguarding us from the dystopian uh, dictators that can actually use this technology. So I believe on that. And I believe that uh, there's a lot of wealth for everyone. I think we, I believe in really cooperation. I'm working with fantastic people. I love my team. Sometimes I, I think I try to calm down as my um, energy. Not everyone can cope with my energy, but I'm learning how to do that. And uh, so I apologize to a lot of my team because sometimes not everyone can cope with things, but I think that is the point. So as a companies right now, the three companies we have and we're creating two, are all focused on products and products that are really like Cities ABC, Open Business Council, and as well Fashion ABC and Intelligent HQ that is more a reflection platform. So we have the media for reflecting ideas, research, keeping research is key for me. I'm actually writing a lot of things. I wrote the book, a small ebook about the NFTs that we're going to launch soon. I, I write to learn and to do a right now small videos in my YouTube channel, but I love to learn and continue learning. And I wanna make sure that our platforms are these platforms open to humanity. And of course, anyone can use it. And I, I would love to have more people cooperating, but that is more difficult, but we're learning how to do that. Wonderful. If there was one message you could depart to our listeners today as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message? Well, oh, the difficult one. So I would say I love the idea of humanity-centric. And, and when I think about humanity-centric, uh, one of the things that comes to my mind is that you don't want to live in a house full of garbage. <laughs> so I think uh, sometimes when we go from the theory to the practice, some people are, okay, no, there's no problem about climate change because it doesn't touch me. Well, it's touching everyone. And I think your backyard, if you have a house, if you're lucky to have a house, or even if you have a, a living room, you don't have the garbage in your living room. So you don't want as well to go to an ocean and, and find that. So I think this humanity first, but as well, practical level of your house. Look at your house and see, do you want your world to be full of garbage? Do you want, it's a very simple thing, but it's a very important thing. And the, the quantity of plastic and things. So I think the sustainability starts by each of us. And you are in German, that, uh, that is, uh, all my German friends were much more advanced, I remember, than, than the rest of the world. But as well, you are the first ones going for the revolution. <laughs> the fourth in, this, the, in your case, it was the fourth industrial revolution that was very polluting. So you went actually 100 years ahead than most of the world. So a lot of other countries are picking that. So I would say that starting by your house and start thinking at a pragmatic level. And that, for instance, I'm actually, I'm still not a vegetarian, but I'm trying to go on that direction. And I'm trying to go with things that actually can make a measurement of my own data in a way that can actually, so the quantified self, but in a way that can actually improve my performance and using, if we spend like six hours minimum per day in front of devices, let's use that to improve our sustainability. So how can we use that to learn, listen to podcasts like ours and uh, yours is fantastic on that, learn and then just have fun. Uh, you can be running and learning. That's the wonderful thing about our time. So that's my, my note. <laughs> that's wonderful. And yeah, I believe on your, your podcast, our discussion that we had together uh, uh it really we talked about that specifically what you said whether you live in a home or an apartment or one room just try never doing the dishes never putting your clothes away never doing your laundry never taking out the garbage never washing a dish never showering uh, eventually that just piles up and we are living on this spaceship earth that's a closed system and although it takes, because it's a big closed system, it takes a little bit longer for us to see the effects, but everyone on the world is seeing those effects today. But just imagine that times a thousand, if you were to do that experiment in your home. And I think most of our listeners are wise enough not to have to go through the misery of doing that experience in their home to learn that there are some very short feedback loops and, and ways to realize that there is some better models to do that and live in that way. 
Dennis, I really want to thank you so much for letting me and my guests inside of your ideas and sharing your mind and your thoughts and your work and what you do. Uh, that's all I have for you today. And I really appreciate your time. And I thank you. And, and uh, that's all I have for you, unless you wanted to have, add one last thing before we say goodbye. No, no, I want to thank you and congratulations for your excellent work. I think it's really important that you profile the people you're doing because I learned a lot with the people in profiling, but it's really key people for making a better world. So congratulations as well on your work. And, and I think we'll be working much more. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dennis. Take care. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.